Hello and welcome to the Courageous Influence Talk Show where we have courageous conversations that help build people of courageous influence. I'm your host Alex Cutterford. I'm joined by my mate and pastor Caleb Dwyer. Hey. <laughs> hey. How are you mate? Yeah, good. Eh? In a good mood? <laughs> yeah, yeah, stoked. <laughs> Glad to be here. Uh, there's one thing that we've learnt folks, you got to keep the talent happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently one of our loyal listeners suggested that at the start of last week's show, I did not look like I wanted to be here. Uh, I think the loyal listener is our producer. <laughs> <laughs> you have to tell everyone that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was just want to go with that theme and see how it worked. Good call, good call. We'll be having a performance review. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. get, get called into the executive producer's <laughs> office. <laughs> Um, that's all right, because I got some more positive feedback on our show Come from on. someone else the other day. <laughs> it was the episode you went in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm noticing a trend here. Even the views, you know? Yeah. Mm, no, it's, we, um, it's worth getting up early. No, nah, nah, that, that actually has less views than the ones that you've been in. So okay, thank you. All good. Don't worry, mate. All, all right, right, let's you, go. Your spot's still. Biggest Clear. fail. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I was once on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so I do a podcast with this guy. And, but <laughs> I feel like we get enough fails in every morning before we start filming mm-hmm. that it could last us a lifetime. Mm-hmm. Um, but I kind of feel like I know that any fail that I came up with this week isn't going to top yours. So I just <laughs> thought we would just stick with yours this week. You were present for my biggest fail. Oh, I reckon mm. it was the biggest win of my week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I knew. I was like, this is both the biggest fail and biggest win. <laughs> Yeah, and I probably can't go into all the details on a podcast, but I was, we had a great night, had the young adults connect from GCB around at home, sitting up on our hill with fire pits, looking out over our city, having a good time, giving a little bit of a stir up to... was nice. uh, Just encourage the guys that, you know, in this season while church isn't connecting so often, uh, not to feel that their faith life sort of drifts into the background or in a great way to keep it in the foreground and, and a good practice anyway as a young person is just to be memorising some really important scripture that can be an absolute anchoring thought. Um, we touched on it last week actually. Is, I was thinking out of that conversation last week that made mm. me decide to share that. Mm. Um, having some real anchors in our world and was, yeah, sharing away and got royally sledged. I walked myself into it. It was probably... <laughs> Both the edgiest uh, and funniest sledge that's ever come my way during a preach, <laughs> and completely lost everyone, including myself, for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Had nothing to do but seriously laugh. It was very well done, and for those who are wondering, it was Mr. Charlie Chico. Right, those boys didn't stop there. <laughs> yeah, it, it was sledge after sledge, and then Charles just took it and just <laughs> knocked it out of that ballpark. <laughs> it was very, very good. They were. Um yeah, they were hammering you. I could do nothing but good. admire the work. It's like you're there trying to like address the things of fear mm. in our s- <laughs> and you can't you're trying to wade through all the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, we're a very fearful bunch here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They couldn't be more casual. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was good fun. I yeah. I love that. I'm not yeah. precious about those sort of things at all. It's good boys are having a laugh and um yeah, it was it was sharp. It was on point and it came out of nowhere. I did not yeah. see it coming. Once once you get the three Chico boys together and mm. then chuck in the fourth with the old man, mm-hmm. there's um they just seem they feed off each other. Yes. And they sharpen each other. Mm. Iron sharpens iron, especially with banter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I did just re- get in the zone. <laughs> I do remember the I had only met the boys a, a handful of times or maybe even less. Um and we held a, it was in the early days before we'd actually started church services in Bathurst and we held a connect group around at their place. And um, we were learning about the culture of the church and the sort of things that we were going to value as a church and um, listening to some content by Pastor Ben. It was a pre-record. And so we're all sitting around the Chico's lounge room watching this stuff and I can't remember which two it was, but I'm pretty sure it was um, Charlie and Jake sitting down beside the, lounge and then Luke sitting on the lounge beside them and again it was just banter sledge and then they'd never even met the bloke and they start sledging past a band on his <laughs> pre-record and I leant over to Renee and like Madge is sort of giving the boys looks like stop it and I leant over and I reckon, I'm gonna, good like, impression. I reckon I'm gonna like these lads <laughs> <laughs> yep, nah, they're good value 
Very good value. Um, well, that's awesome, mate. I'm glad that we've had some good banter going this week. I was just because th- I was thinking about that. I was driving over and I was like, actually, good banter is a sign of great trust. Mm. It's like because you can't get banter going until you feel like completely comfortable with how someone else is going to take it. And I think you know, that's probably why I mean you can get some good banter yeah. going at times. It's yeah. like when it's a sign of great trust. So if you ever, when you've found someone that you can banter with, you've found a good thing. Yeah. A friend that you trust where each other at, you know, mm. and take it the wrong way. And that should be a verse in the Bible. So <laughs> it's sort of like a man that finds a, a wife has found a good thing. Yeah. A man that finds a friend he can banter with has found a good thing. Correct. Steward it well. Yeah, yeah. I like it. <laughs> Hold it tight. Um, so I thought we could get into some life lesson, lesson lessons. Definitely not going to be teaching anyone English again. Mm-hmm. When life gives you lessons. <laughs> uh, um, actually, my fail this week can uh, producer. Can you play the latest um, sound bite that you got from our <laughs> our um, talk show last week? Can you play it? The producer. They know. Oh, they know which on. one it is. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's my fail. <laughs> I thought it was that laugh. laugh. <laughs> that wasn't the laugh, was it? Where's the laugh? Yeah. That we listened to this morning. That was the laugh. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's that's what Caleb does to me. You you make me <laughs> giggle like that. I'm like, Ooh, okay. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so that's my fail. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like that laugh should become the new fail intro or outro. All right, you reckon? Do it. Yep. yep, it's done. Executive cool. decision made. Nice. <laughs> the producers don't look impressed. <laughs> um, one Welcome of them does. to fails with <laughs> Alex and Caleb. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's move into some life lessons before this. Um, Falls into a big pit of laughter. Mm-hmm. What have you been uh, thinking about this week, mate? Um, just thinking about inspiring people, and that we can't, you cannot truly inspire people you do not first respect. Mm. You know, often when we want to inspire someone, we're wanting to inspire change or growth in them. Um, but if you don't have a genuine respect for people first, mm. um, there's going to be a, a level of disconnect. Yeah, and so I think you can from a distance. For like, I was trying to when I was thinking about this concept um, and thinking about it in my own life, thinking, yeah, when I want to inspire people, I've really got to respect them as a person and respect their story, and maybe even validate where they're at without necessarily agreeing. Mm. Um, but um, if that's missing, you know, you can try your hardest to inspire, and you're just actually going to make them more and more frustrated with you and yeah. more and more disconnected. Yeah. Um, but I think it's bigger than that because you probably can inspire people, you know, sports stars and stuff inspire people from a distance. Yeah. They might have absolute contempt for our lack of sporting ability. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you, so you can from a distance and you can for a short time. Excuse me one moment. <coughs> yeah. But you can't inspire someone up close over time unless you respect them. Mm. Even if you want them to move, even if you want them to change, even if you see there's areas of weakness in them, you've got to respect them as a human being. Yeah. Respect their story if you want to inspire them. Otherwise, yeah, absolutely. it just breeds Because it's a fine line, isn't it? When when it comes to helping someone change, like there's a fine line between inspiring change or trying to control people mm-hmm. or people feeling controlled, mm-hmm. even if that's not your goal. Because you might be trying to inspire someone to change, if there's yeah, if there's that missing link of respect or that connection, they're gonna feel controlled rather than inspired. Yeah. And so yeah, that respect allows you to have that connection with someone that the change that you're presenting or offering or trying to draw them towards can be accepted and, and taken hold of and seen as a positive goal to work towards rather than someone trying to drag you somewhere that you're not ready to go or you don't want to go. Yeah. Or even I don't think yeah. we're patient enough when we don't respect the person and we, we maybe don't, um, you know, if we want to inspire change in people, we have to respect them enough to help them see the reason why. <coughs> you know, we tend to jump and 
I'm definitely in this. Like I'm learning in this process. I'm, I was thinking a lot about, um, you know, my own ability to inspire change in people. So this is not something that's judgy about anyone else. But thinking through it and going, well, so often um, as a leader you can get so wrapped up in the idea of the change. So the person's here and I need them over here. And that just becomes the focus instead of realising, well, does the person even understand their need for change? Maybe they understand a need for change but they've tried before and failed and so they have Mm. absolutely no belief in themselves to change. Mm. Maybe someone's tried to force them to change before before they were ready and they've got some deep hurts and things that need addressing first. And so if you don't respect the person enough to try and discover their journey, where they're at, what their motivation is, why they're at where they're at, and then, you know, you can't get someone to move somewhere until you fully understand or at least partly understand or empathise at least with the fact that they're at where they're at. Yeah. And then help them. And so because we can skip over that because we're driven, you know, we're leaders and we want to see the, the, the result and we want to see the change happen, um, if we just push ahead with that, the, the groundwork that needs to be done can actually be missed. And, mm. and the, the, one of the really sad things in that, say a person's really stuck in life and there's some really deep wounds and lack of self-confidence mm. and, and things and we just try and push for the change – Whereas if we go a bit slower, we respect the person enough to learn why they're at where they're at, then not only can we inspire change to the next level, but if you've built confidence and a sense of achievement and a a sense of, uh, yes, I can do this and it was actually okay to ask for help and there's all these other lessons you can learn along the way that helps them then make the next step maybe self-motivated. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think that's that's the big key to all of it, I think, is that, when someone actually starts becoming feeling seen, heard, they can process some of their pain. Mm. Like people know often they know what the change is that needs to be made. They just don't feel capable of doing it. Right. And like that foundational mm. work often, mm. if that is done with someone, like you don't need to try and make people change. Mm. Like people, once they feel healthy and strong and confident, will try to build a good life for themselves. Yeah. Um, and once they understand that there's – who they are, they become strong in their identity. Typically someone's going to then want to start exploring how they can grow and they might then become asking questions, oh, how do I grapple with this? Yes. And, yeah, this doesn't work pulling people towards change. The other thing that's probably needs to be thought through is, well, why do I want them to change to this? Right. And what's what are my motives in this? And do they actually even want to get there? Yes. Like, because even someone that's healthy might just have a different direction in where what they want to change or right. perception of, no, actually, I don't think that's something that needs to be changed. And sometimes it doesn't and sometimes it does. And yeah. there's, yeah, you can't take that it, juggle. You can't take that sense of autonomy and agency off people. Mm. Yeah. Um, while it's, trying to inspire them. It's probably one of the um, hardest things for a pastor to have to work through in terms of the nuances of your role how to, you know when it comes to like ins- inspiring people in their life and challenging them and you're going to start working with them on that i just think it's not something you'll always get right but yeah you know i've been doing it long enough now that some of these bigger things begin to dawn on you, you yeah like, oh that's why that one worked and that didn't and that's where i need to grow in my understanding and mm-hmm. how i can help people more i think another one that i've really um i only truly discovered in recent years is the difference between agreeing with someone or validating their thoughts and and so because we may not necessarily agree with someone's thoughts and someone who's stuck in negativity or self-doubt um it's doesn't mean you can't validate them and listen Mm. to them and say you know and it's it's sometimes it's just being intentional with your language and saying hey i can see why you feel that way Mm. yeah i can i can hear your story i hear why you've ended up viewing the world yeah. like that. And yeah. you're not saying, hey, it's right. Hey, stay yeah. there. You know, hey, you should be bitter. Yeah. But hey, I can see actually why you've got to a point that you're really angry at the world. I, yeah. I, I can see that that's a, a valid response yeah. to your situation, but is it the best response to help you move forward? So mm. it's not it's not like, oh, you're an idiot. Why did you even get there? But you, yeah, yeah, hey, I can see that. I can empathise with you. I can yeah. validate where you're at. Yeah. It's like, yeah, if I saw the world like that, yes, I yeah. would feel like that. Right. Yeah. But hey... Um, come on, can we maybe think about that differently? And and it's how you have those conversations, mm. starting yeah. from a point of, yeah, I'm with you, rather than, hey, I'm against yeah. you. Yeah. 
and being yeah, and being with someone, and for plenty of time before feeling that need to pull them. Like I, I know in my early days of marriage and having to learn, you know, how to connect with another person on a deeper level and there were times that <laughs> Melissa's like this expressing pure anxiety about something and I'm this like was very incapable <laughs> of recognizing what it was and understanding it and then so there was times when this left her completely invalidated yeah. when all she actually because I'm like looking at of what do I agree with rather than just identifying with someone in a moment right and so that was definitely a skill I, I had to learn of how to recognise um, things for what they are and how to help validate someone, even if it, cause it ha- and recognising it has nothing to do with agreeing yes. um, in certain situations because they themselves know, especially if it's someone in the example of anxiety, mm-hmm. like once they've come out, they know themselves like that it's not something that they agree with. Right. But it might just be something in a moment when someone's feeling triggered and stuff that... Um, they just need to be heard in that moment. Right. And allowing them to express their feelings, isn't it? Like, mm. Rather than shutting it down, you know, I'm, oh, I'm so anxious about that. Well, come on, that's crazy. You don't need to be anxious about that. Yeah. But validating it. Okay, tell me why you're feeling like that, how you're feeling like it, what's led to that. Mm. Okay, and then the conversation can be, yeah, I can see why this has been difficult for you again. What can I do to help you right now? Is there anything mm. I can do? Yeah. So you're just entering in beside them rather than just straight away coming to correct it. Yeah. Yeah, and so yeah. that's the nuance, mm. but they're vital. And I, I would like first to say I don't always get this right, and certainly in the past I haven't. But they're things that I'm beginning to learn and, mm. and, and value more highly. Mm. Yeah, yeah, awesome. That's very good. That's a good comfort to have. Um, this my one will sort of lead into that a little bit. So mine is understanding your core values will help you identify your triggers. So by triggers, I'm talking about when something happens Mm -hmm. that maybe the response is far greater than what has happened. So, you know, it might be a little comment sends you into immediate anger or immediate anxiety or immediate fear in a very strong response um, is what I'm sort of meaning by trigger. So when someone says something and all of a sudden you get this really narky response back, (laughs) um, which is what I sort of did to Melissa the other day (laughs) and and... uh, it got us, luckily, I have a very good wife that was willing to like stick with the conversation rather than letting me do my preferred mode of, <laughs> oh, just don't talk about it for 10 minutes and then I'll be right and I'll move on and we won't actually get to the yeah, root of what the problem was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My emotions but are better so we're not going back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but she, it was like we're getting ready in the morning and I did say and she said, um, that felt really inconsiderate. And I'm like, and I got really frustrated. I'm not inconsiderate. What are you talking about? And, and we're sort of, and getting, and I was really frustrated. Um, and then she's sort of saying like, why are you so frustrated by me saying that I felt like that was inconsiderate? And I'm, in my mind, I'm just like, why wouldn't you be? Mm-hmm angry that someone said you're inconsiderate and then as and then as 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 my sort of emotions come down not that i was like fired up i don't exactly get super fired up but oh. fired up for me in my head this was the first time i've seen alex just like nah. throwing the couch what do you mean <laughs> 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 bailey's going out the back door <laughs> <laughs> no nah. but i was i was feeling frustrated there and then as i'm starting to <laughs> Oh, uh, we're we're doing a good job of um, debunking the stigma around um, sharing emotions, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Ooh. laughs> um, so yeah, I was um, feeling frustrated, and as we're talking through it, and then I was was starting to identify that, okay, well, what it eventually came around to was you saying I'm being inconsiderate is like saying I'm not loving you. And for me, the one of my biggest core values is loving Melissa well, mm-hmm. serving her well, you know, being a really great, caring husband to her. So her saying, I feel like you're being in, you are inconsiderate, I'm hearing, why don't you love me? <laughs> wow. And I'm going, I love you so much. Yeah. 
gee, there's, it's like, I love you all the time. I feel like, it's like, surely this is just one little lapse. How could you like go from that to, you don't love me? But she hadn't said you don't love me. <laughs> yeah, well. And so what I was recognising in that moment, I was like, ah, oh, she's pressed on a core value of mine. Yes. And it's triggered me because I felt like she was saying that I wasn't living up to a core value. Yep. Um, and so that this made me realise if you identify your core values, that helps you identify your triggers. Because yep. when you're getting triggered by saying, it's normally because you're feeling like someone's saying something about the core of you mm -hmm. that you don't feel is incorrect or, or correct or it might be another situation where... Um, or maybe especially if you feel like you have violated a core value, mm. that'll really set yeah, you off maybe in, a di in guilt or something. That's so, the worst. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I just thought that was it's an interesting really, discovery. Yeah, it is. Mm. And it's good. I don't think we even stop sometimes enough to self-reflect enough on those sort of things, especially as Aussie blokes. Yeah, we prefer the banter. Um, I think we should just be both. Mm. Now, I don't think we need to shut down banter and ban Aussie blokes, but then we do need to have the – courage to look at things like that within ourselves and go what are my core values and why does that, that sort of comment really upset me more than maybe it should and yeah and have the courage to unpack that stuff mm. i think it's really cool yeah one of the um one of the things i do with couples often whether it's in um marriage support or pre-marriage support is um we talk about what we call reflective listening and that would be a perfect example where we do it because what you heard was not what was said, mm. and we all do that. Yeah. And so Renners and I, we learned this. Uh, boy, we'd probably only been married about eighteen months, I reckon, and we did some marriage support ourselves, and came across this technique. And it sounds really full on, and we've done it and practiced it enough now that usually we can bring it into our conversation before things get to a silly point. Yeah. Um, but sometimes you have to stop and actually, in, and, and, and so we won't even. Um, intentionally say come on do some reflective listening with me we just begin to do it with one another yeah but the idea is you so in that situation you know you're starting to get angry and will be like well hang on alex what do you think i've said and you're, like, you're saying i don't even love you and, <laughs> and then she's like did no, i say I, what i said was <laughs> mm. and they're not allowed to argue or defend themselves okay and you're not allowed to argue or defend yourself until you get clarity. So you keep going, no, what I said was that was inconsiderate. Oh, so you're saying I'm just an inconsiderate pig. No, you're actually incredibly considerate. That's why I noticed it so much when you did this one. I'm saying that moment was really inconsiderate and that frustrated me. And then you reflect back and it has to be in your own words. Oh, so what you're actually saying is you value that I do try and be considerate to you and I've violated that on this occasion, you feel, and that's something you want me to think about. Yes. Mm. Well, that has just brought the conversation <laughs> way down. And yeah. now what you've managed to do is instead of having these back and forth between each other, you've come together and actually articulated what the problem is. Mm. And until you've articulated what her first feelings are and she's happy with how you're reflecting it back to her in your own words, mm. you don't move on to you then even responding to that. Yeah. But then once you do, you then respond to it um, – she has to reflect back to you until she's understanding your response because normally what you end up with then is two sets of ideas or you, you, you can clearly articulate where the breakdown was because your response yep. might be, I didn't mean, I always want to um, um, be considerate of you but on this occasion I'm in a hurry. She goes, oh, so you're not going to consider me anytime you're in a hurry? No, I'm just saying like, Especially because I was on my way, and I have no idea of the situation, but mm. I was on my way to work and it, it's really important at the moment that I get to work on time. you know. And then you work it out and she's going, okay, so what you're saying is in that moment you just had to get to work and out the door. You didn't mean it to be a reflection on me. Exactly. And then you go, okay, so here's our problem. That action I did made you feel really unconsidered. And yet right at the moment you need to know that you can just get what you need to get done in the morning to get to work on time because you're under the pump at work. So now you've got two things. That was the problem, that those two mm. values collided in that moment. You've mm. got them and then you sit beside each other and sometimes if couples are really edgy, we actually get them to write down those two statements. Here's our two problems that are conflicting right now. Write them down, put them on the table and we're actually going to sit next to each other and go, here's the problem. It's not between us, but we have the power to come together 
and fix that mm. rather than having that cause us to start sling, slinging mud at one another. Yeah. And all of a sudden you go, oh, we can fix that really quickly. How about we get up 15 minutes earlier and have a coffee together so that I feel considered and cared for in the morning and then you can just race out the door. Yeah, I can do that. No worries. And or whatever. You can just yeah. work a solution out. Yeah. So That's really good. Anyway. There you go. Some free counselling yeah. <laughs> uh, for everyone this morning. So, yeah, no, that's really good. It's um, it's just one of those learnt skills, I think, that it's just a part of life that you need to learn. One, how to understand your own emotions, understand your core values, and then go on the journey in a marriage context, mm. how you bring those values together. And yep. it's an ever-evolving journey that you go on. So yeah, it is. Yeah. And, and it never stops. Like that technique mm. just helps cut some of the anger and frustration out of it. But we still have to use it sometimes mm. because you're growing, you're changing. Like, yeah, it's it's continued communication right. with one another. How long yeah. have you guys been married now? Five years. Five years. Mm. And I would suggest that already Melissa's not the person you married. Yeah, no. Right? And no, we're completely different, both of us. Right. And isn't that – like I didn't realise that before being married. You're like, oh, I love this girl so much. I'm going to love her forever. And then all of a sudden you're married for a couple of years and they begin to change. Mm. And you're like – Couple of years, couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Melissa's a quick learner. Bagged in, uh, <laughs> locked in. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, hang on. <laughs> I can see the producer going for a button. <laughs> 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 I thought it was going to be the wah, wah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, because, well, again, in, in marriage support, you have people come to you and say, he's not the guy I married or she's not. And I'm like, mm hmm. And do you reckon you're the guy she married or do you reckon you're the, you know, whatever? Oh, like, of course you've changed. Did you did the you want her to stay a 19-year-old forever? Right. <laughs> yeah, it's actually important that you've both changed. Yeah. And But because you are both growing and changing, these sort of issues never disappear yeah. in a relationship. They should get less and less as you... You, you, you learn skills and especially that, that built-up trust that you have with one another. Right. Definitely levels out a lot of the frustrations Absolutely. or... And there's less fear around it because when it first happens, it's a shock to you. You're like, what? We were never going to fight. What? <laughs> this, this is different. <laughs> <laughs> now you're just, yeah, after a while you recognise this is going to be oh. different. <laughs> I'll describe it like a, uh, this is a, probably a little bit vulnerable, but let me go there. Mm. I describe it like a, a stream. And when you're first together, it's a shallow stream. But there's lots of froth and bubble and, you know, it's exciting. It's white water and everyone can see it. But after you've been <laughs> married for a long time. I don't want to see it, mate. <laughs> no, come on, mate. Morning podcast. <laughs> it's pretty obvious. Yeah, you see that couple and they even, like, they'll be sitting in church next to each other, worshipping with their hands yeah. in the air, <laughs> <laughs> Held to, ha- holding yeah. hands or whatever. Like, yeah. And then I used to think, oh, I never want that to wane. But it mm. does. But what I would say and what I encourage young people in is it will change. But that's a good thing. Yeah. And it actually changes more to imagining you know, a deep river. It doesn't maybe look that strong on top, but you get inside that and the current and the strength of that pull is heaps stronger than that brook over there that's got lots of white water. Yeah. And so it may look calmer, it may just look, but boy, it runs deeper. Mm. And it is yeah. like, you know, you can just look at your partner after a while and you go, I know, oh, She's upset or, oh, she's feeling nervous in this situation yeah. or oh, I need to get her out of here or I can just look at Renee and be like, and she'll be like, okay, time to go. <laughs> and you, you got that you have depth tele- of understanding. You guys have telepathic uh, conversations. I worry at times like, that Renee can read my mind. <laughs> 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 it's like, stop, <laughs> stop. Get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. No, that's very good. Um, there you go. We've turned today's conversation into... Great little marriage counselling yeah. session. It's good. It's a big part of life. So It is. And these are the courageous conversations blokes should be having with each other. Hey, help, yeah. help me make my marriage better. Yeah. You know? I, reckon, I reckon that's why we have so many people go to our wedding. It's not for free food and a couple of drinks. All right? It's when I go to someone's wedding, whether I'm like, for me, one of the greatest privileges of being in ministry is marrying people. I love it. I love doing the pre-marriage support. I love marrying them. I love being present in that moment. And I, I, every single marriage ceremony I've done, I remind the congregation that we're not just here today to watch the vows, but we're actually saying 
we as your community of friends and family will do everything we can to support and protect this marriage. Mm. And we need it. Mm. And so as blokes, because we can be bullfeds at times, you know, we need guys that care enough about us to talk about stuff and help us be better husbands. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, now we might move on to our reading of John. Mm. What's been standing out to you this week? Look, the thing that just jumped out to me this week was probably just some narrative rather than deep theological things. And it was uh, where Jesus' brothers are yet to believe. Uh, it's in John chapter 7, just at the beginning. Jesus' brothers are yet to believe or understand his Masonic identity. Mm-hmm. And um, first of all, I would like to put a disclaimer in there of who can blame them. <laughs> like, yeah, I've got brothers, and if one of them had said to me, Caleb, pretty sure I'm the saviour of the world, <laughs> I'd have been like, nah. uh, Yeah, look, I know mum's always going on about it. But <laughs> yeah, I know your mum's favourite. She's favorite, crazy. <laughs> I've beaten you in cricket in the backyard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's with that? <laughs> so um, I don't blame them for being a bit sceptical. Fair call, fair call. But they, and they were. And even like, you know, you don't know how much Joseph and Mary told them about, well, actually, you Mum was pregnant. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but we didn't do anything. We didn't anything. do the wrong thing. Yeah, sure. well, whatever, Dad. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. Boys, I want you to make sure you wait till marriage. Dad. Well, just like you did, Dad. <laughs> dad, you got to learn to how to open up and shit. <laughs> yeah, be vulnerable, Dad. Yeah. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> <laughs> so I reckon there's a whole bunch of, and who knows, like we're just yeah. having fun. But yeah, yeah. irrespective, it's clear, what is clear in Scripture is that they didn't initially. And yet we also know that, um, Jesus' brother's uh, misunderstanding of who he was did did not stop Jesus continuing to follow his call and mission, mm. and I think that's a there's something huge to be yeah. wrestled with in that. Like how often when someone misunderstands us, especially someone who we want to have our back, mm. we then just go, "Oh, it's all too hard," or yeah. "I'm not going to," or we question our own. Yeah, or "Oh, maybe I am off." Right. Yeah, and and so. Just the courage, and and again, it just comes back. You watch Jesus time and time again. His his sense of self was through his relationship with the Father, yeah. and and he, and he invested heavily in that relationship. Mm. And I just think if we're going to be followers of Jesus, um, some of the great principles of how to live as a disciple are picked up on the way Jesus lived, yeah. and in the narrative, not just the principles he taught. Yeah. And so one of those things that you see over and over and over again is that Jesus regularly went and spent time with the Father. His identity was worked out in isolation and solitude with the Father. Yeah. He was certain of who he was. He was certain of what he was called to do. And even when his own brothers didn't believe, he didn't let that um, throw him off. But the other thing I notice is that he also then didn't allow that to destroy. His brother's misunderstanding of who he was, he was so secure that he didn't have to attack them. He didn't have to hate his brothers and go, oh, you're a bunch of losers, get away, you're going to destroy my call. No, I am. Yeah. <laughs> I am God. <laughs> I am too. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> yeah. All right, because in the end, yep. um, most scholars believe that James is actually Jesus' brother and he goes on and be, be, uh, becomes one of the great elders in the early church. Yeah. So there was enough relationship and for restoration and for his brother to definitely end up believing in him after the resurrection and, and becoming a pillar in the church. And I'm like, wow, Jesus didn't allow two things. He didn't allow his brother's misunderstanding of his calling get him off track, but he also didn't allow any pain around that stop him from continuing to help them towards their calling. Mm. And I'm like, how often has someone who's hurt me or misunderstood what I'm about and then I just build walls, like, I don't want that pain, yeah, I'm not going to help them so much anymore. It's not how Jesus lived. Yeah, it's pretty mm. phenomenal. Yeah, there's there's so many layers that come into that, isn't there? Because you need because if you're going to stick with someone that's either you know going to act in a way towards you that can be hurtful, you need to be very strong mm. in your personal identity, um, who you are, what you are willing to accept. Mm to be around you and stuff, to be able to keep people close to you that may, whether intentionally or not, want to do harm to you yeah. um, emotionally and, and stuff. So, yeah, you got to have that strong identity. Yes. Like you can't 
just keep loving people well without that because that's when you fall into the doormat oh, situation. And yeah. yeah, yeah, you've still got to be strong about who you are, not pushed around by it. And I think there's a few writers I would say in that sort of conversation is one of them would be around abuse. Yeah, all right. You, there's no excuse f- for someone abusing you. Yeah, and you have wh- whether we're talking about physical, emotional, spiritual, whatever it may be. If someone is consistently trying to abuse you, you have every right to build whatever wall you need to to keep yourself safe yeah. from that abuse. And yeah. Don't stay there in the sense no. of, of Jesus wouldn't walk away. Right. Yeah. And especially as a you know, a middle-class white Christian male pastor, I, I think it's important that we're heard to say that. I'm, and I'm not giving people an excuse to walk away from every marriage that just has some difficulty. I think it's important that we stay and fight for marriage. You know, it's a vow. And um, I think that in society today in general, we walk away from that too quickly. But the flip side has been true of the church for a long time where sometimes people have been encouraged, whether it be a marriage or a a family relationship or something, that, oh, no, you've got to stay in there. And hang on, they're flat out abusing them. Mm. Like This is dangerous for that person's health. Um, They need to build... and. For me, what I always would do... Now, again, <laughs> it's, it's hard in a podcast like this to make statements that you can always find a counter to. Yeah. Like there's always exceptions to the rule. Yeah. So I'm not speaking in absolutes right now, but one of the things that I would encourage people is that you leave the door open. Right? But before the person's allowed to walk through that. So you, you forgiveness is offered, but um, because that's one of the things that Christians will often really guilt themselves out with is, oh, I haven't forgiven that person. Well, hang on. You can confi- you can offer forgiveness, but until that ch- person chooses to repent, which is a one eighty, change their way of thinking, believing, and therefore behaving, you don't have to allow them back into that level of relationship. Yeah, that that's not a lack of forgiveness. Mm. Um, a forgiveness that says I I respect you and the door is open to you, but I'm before I allow you anywhere near an opportunity for that level of intimacy there needs to be repentance yeah absolutely that's that's healthy yeah um now i also would understand that there are occasions especially when it comes to certain forms of abuse that that door should never be opened again and and yeah. and fine um so yeah it's hard to talk in absolute yeah, things, yeah. yeah. But, um i think it's a general principle in life when it's not abuse we we want to hang in there with people and keep believing in them even if they're not believing in you yeah yeah absolutely and it's having one of the other mindsets you're going to have to have to do that is having a real long term mindset for things, isn't it? And and people, like you can't just be all caught up in the immediate moment. Oh, they're not believing in me now. Ride them off forever. Right. You know, like you got to recognise that everyone. We're all on a journey. Why should everyone understand what you're on about and yes. what you believe in straight away? Like they, it's not even. It's not even an appropriate expectation, really. So you got to have that mindset of what someone's thinking about me right now doesn't have to affect the entirety of our mm. relationship. Mm. Like, you can't this otherwise, everyone has to agree with you all the time, everything you come up with, yes, in order to maintain connection. And that's yeah. just not realistic. You're not going to do it for them. <laughs> so, yeah, very interesting. Um, was there anything else no, standing out? What do you got, mate? Um, So I had a few things from a bit further back. So I was just one of those other things that it's like it's not necessarily a direct lesson but something that you pick up as as you just come across it and it's when John, um, his disciples are coming to him about how Jesus is baptising people on the other side of the Jordan. Which river? (laughs) I don't know which passage you're talking about. Uh, in um, John 3.30. Let's have a look. Um, and so John had been baptising a lot of people. A lot of people have been coming to him for yes. um, yeah, yeah, getting yeah, baptised. Yep. And he was preaching the repentance of sins for forgiveness. And then Jesus is starting his ministry and he's starting to baptise people, even though it wasn't actually Jesus, but his disciples were doing it. Right. And all John's guys are saying, Oi, this guy's... Taken all our, yeah, he's all our crowd. Oh, what's going on? And he, and then John says, he must become, I must become less, and he mm. must become greater. Um, and that 
brings a real lesson to us, even though he's just talking about something for him and this moment between him and Jesus, but it actually becomes a real great picture for us of something that we build our life on, of allowing Christ to become greater in us uh, and allowing less of ourselves. Now, I do want to sort of preface that with a bit, is that it can often sound... um, Oh, what's the word for it? Well, not self-deprecating, but you know, we, people can sort of mean like, oh, it's not about me. It's all that Jesus. I want more of Jesus and taking yourself out of the equation. Mm-hmm. Like it's like bring Jesus in and get me out. So I don't mean it in that sense, but more so the sense of allowing what Christ has spoken over us, teach and, uh, teach, uh, taught. taught us. Taught us, yeah. <laughs> to become Someone's what we build ourselves on and mm. how we build ourselves and building ourselves with him and that connection with him and rather than just doing life our way, however we want to do it, to our own detriment. Mm. And so um, that picture that John gave us of he must become greater, I must become less can be a really great building block for it's our great, life. Al. Yeah, Incredible humility in it too, isn't there? Yeah. And so... Keeping that, like bringing that element of humility into our life without this sense of, oh yeah, I'm gross, I suck. Right. I I need Jesus in my life because I'm terrible. Like it's not about that, it's about that humility to recognise here is the son of God and he wants to help me build my life mm. in relationship with him and we can do that. And there was a guy who used to come over from the States a bit with Young Life. He came over sort of twice a year and did some teaching with us on our retreats and he used to often, so he used this line as um, in breath prayer. So that's where you might, it's a form of sort of prayer and meditation where you just sort of sit with God and sometimes you might try and find something that you really connect with on God through scripture Mm -hmm to just draw you into a close connection with him. And he used to, and so breath prayer is sort of where you stop, you maybe go somewhere quiet um, and you sort of focus on your breathing a bit. But rather than it just being a moment to sort of clear your mind, you're sort of finding something that draws you into a close, intimate right. connection with God. And he used to, so on his in-breath, he would sort of pray um, more of you and on his out prayer, um, less of me hmm. and he used that just to really draw him into a close sort of slowing down state to connect with God um, and he, yeah and he drew on that scripture to do that so um, it, it is an interesting tension as you're talking about where it's not in a way of obviously without Christ and renewal humanity is depraved but we're also made in the image of Christ so there's incredible value there mm. and so even as you're talking there you know, more of you less of me, I'm thinking, great, because I want more of the fruit of the Spirit, less of the fruit of Caleb. Yeah. Right? But I don't then have to take it to that thing of um, self-hate. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, what I'm even praying in that moment is, I want to be your temple. Mm. Like, my life has so much value that the God of all creation would make me his temple. Yeah. So there's incredible dignity in humanity when you think about yeah. that. Yeah, you're valuing yourself more right. by seeking to be more like him because it's not that you're getting rid of you, you're transforming you. Mm. you know, you're know, you not just getting rid of you and getting a bit of God. Mm. You're asking God to Putting, build you. Yeah, him in the correct place. Yeah. Like you are God, I am the creation. And yeah. by acknowledging that, it values yeah. self, yeah. but it values God you're more. You're giving more value to what you are rather yeah. than... Trying to this, yeah, make yourself God, right? And putting yourself in the correct place, yeah. And what an amazing thought that the God of all creation actually loves you, wants to be with you. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's really cool, Al. Um, one of the other ones was in John four twenty seven, mm. and so it's when he's connecting with the Samaritan woman at the well. Yes, and so he's spoken into her life, um, and he's told her everything about herself um, and all of this. And so but it was the interesting part that was just standing out was with the disciples have come back. Mm -hmm. They've seen Jesus talking to this Samaritan woman, Mm -hmm. but none of them have the guts to say, 
Jesus, what are you doing? Because culturally, you're right. No one does it. They're not talk. They wouldn't be talking to a woman by herself. They wouldn't be talking to a Samaritan person. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, big cultural taboo. And Jesus is classic fashion, <laughs> going against the grain. And so, but and all the guys, none of them have the guts to say to Jesus, "What are you doing?" They're all going to each other. Yeah. What's Jesus up to now? Let's not ask because they didn't, they know. Uh, we're going to be wrong no matter what. <laughs> so they're off talking to each other, but he's um, he's pretty um, privy to what's going on anyway. But it was one of the things that I was um, this getting out of that was just the reminder of that lesson is that of you're going to teach people more by what you do than what you say. Hmm. And so Jesus wasn't even needing to go and try and give them a lesson. Is this living his living his life? following the lead of the Spirit to go talk to this woman. And just in that act, now he's got his closest disciples watching and going, uh-huh. oh, I think something's changing, something's yeah. shifting. And that was a real beginning, like that act was a real beginning of what was to come in the church and the way that the gospel was spread mm-hmm. and the revelations that Peter would go on to have about there being no um, separation between Jews and Gentiles and, mm-hmm. and what God wants to do in the world and who God wants to connect with and reveal himself to. Yes. And, you know, and it can come back right to this moment where they're, they're sitting there watching Jesus mm. and starting to learn those lessons in their beginning stages. And so it's just a great reminder that we all teach people just as much by what we do as what we try to teach them and push That's on great. them. Yeah. Can you imagine, like, what it was like for these disciples on a human level. You know, like, you, you finally get to be the disciple, this great teacher, something is a great teacher, some prophet, you know, there's all these different thoughts about exactly who he is, but all you know is that you're wandering around getting to be one of his closest disciples and the guy just keeps turning everything on its head. Like, you'd yeah. be wa- I reckon you wake up some days half excited and half anxious. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> going, Today's going to be cool, but who knows what we're in for. <laughs> oh, man. Um, where was I listening to it the other day when they were talking about probably another podcast? <laughs> yeah, it was probably definitely a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so I was listening to a podcast the other day, and um, they were talking about the pace of life back then and how because we are so jammed pack and going from thing to thing mm-hmm. these days that we don't really have those transition periods. Whereas back then, and you sort of, you read through the Gospels and you can just feel like, oh man, is this going bang, 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 bang. But then you recognise, oh, they walked from here to here. And so they've had like three days to actually go and process a bit while they're walking to the next place. And, yep. um, you know, so like in a moment like that, it's sort of like, yeah, you got a few days there where you can walk along going, what was going on there? I wonder what Jesus was doing. Or you get chatting with him as you're walking along and you're getting those opportunities of transition where you can mm. really be allowing stuff to actually sink in before you bounce on to the next miracle that you're trying to process. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's so good. Yeah. Um, now I have one more. Mm. Oh, goodness. Um, and this one sort of relates back to our conversation last week as well um, in John four fifty, And it was after that, so... He's spoken to this woman. She's mm-hmm. gone running back to the town and said, oh, this guy has this told me everything um, about my life. And, and then a lot of people believed that he was the son of God purely by her testimony. Mm-hmm. And then after he's come to the town, they've, or they've come back to him and he started teaching and preaching to the crowd and more believed. Mm-hmm. Um, and it says that, um, they took Jesus at his word right. and believed that he was the son of God. And I was just thinking, wow, what, like that culture is a so conducive with faith that mm. you are able to take someone at their word to the point that you'd believe that they are the son of God. Yeah, wow. It's like, whoa, this guy, is, there's something about him that that's what he is saying is truth. Yep. And we were talking last week about how doubt has in many ways become a virtue in our culture Mm -hmm. and how unconducive that is with faith. Um, It is such an opposing thing to faith because they are such opposites and it's uh, 
real clashing and which is why you see such a crisis of faith when the culture is so wide towards doubt. But when you have a culture that is wide towards taking someone's word, mm. it it allows for faith to breathe, doesn't it? Yeah. Like It is interesting, the different cultural setting. Yeah. Mm. And so it was... Isn't that... I'm just trying to find it. I'm pretty sure you might recall... Is this not the passage too where they say, oh, at first we believe because of what you said, but now he's spoken yeah. and we believe him for his words. Mm. Oh, it's such a cool picture in that for us too of my job is just to introduce people to Jesus yeah, and then he will speak to them. Mm. And off my testimony, I can plant seeds of faith. Yeah. But when they start to really listen to Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, that was what's standing out to me this that week. That was awesome. Mm. Well, I think that does it for this morning. Thanks, everyone, for tuning in again. Make sure you follow us on Facebook and Instagram on the Generosity Church Bathurst page. You can find us on YouTube at the Generosity Church page. And it helps us if they like and Mm. share. Yeah, like, share, get your friends listening as well. Share, yeah, big time. Also, the Courageous Influence Talk Show on Spotify. So have a good week, folks. All right.